Okay, well, welcome back. I tried my best to scare everyone off yesterday, but it didn't work. I usually do that with my classes, but on the first day, I punch a hole in the blackboard, and, uh, so they think I'm crazy, but there's no blackboard here. So, yeah. you know, but uh, I have a short announcement to make. And she reminded me. So, today is 6606, and uh, so naturally, we'll talk about Lincoln today. Yeah. Uh, you know, and so my my, you know, yesterday the, the the major emphasis of what I had to say was about um, economics, Lincoln and economics, the tariff issue, and the mercantilism issue. Uh, yeah, that was topic for yesterday. Uh, today, uh, it's, it's more going to be on an emphasis on on liberty, Lincoln and and liberty, Lincoln and the Constitution and states' rights, but they are all ultimately linked to economics as well. After all, economic liberty is, is uh, you know, arguably the most important form of liberty. Without economic liberty, we can't really have any other kind of, of liberty. And so uh, it's not as though these are mutually exclusive topics. And that's, by the way, that's one of the things I always uh, admired and was fascinated by when I, as a student, when I was your age, ran across the Austrians like uh, Ludwig von Mises and Murray Rothbard, and that they understood this. They understood that... Uh, to, to understand economics it took more than just economic theory. You had to under, understand something about history, philosophy, uh, mathematics, statistics, as well as the body of economics. And, uh, and there are different schools of thought of economics. So uh, I would urge you to think of the, the, your, your educational experience, uh, those of you who are students, uh, I guess you're all students, uh, one way or another, uh, as, as more interdisciplinary and in, 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 uh, and look at the Austrian school that way too. And so uh, Lincoln and the Constitution. Um, uh, <clears throat> there are a number of books I'll, I'll, uh, I'll tell you about. And uh, one of them, uh, well first I wanna ask you a question. Uh, I think Lou Rockwell just came in a little late and he didn't see my uh, introduction, I don't think. Can you, can you read that, Lou? <laughs> okay. Um, but um, you know, as far as books go, I'm going to be giving you names of some books on Lincoln and the Constitution. But I want to ask you, uh, since everyone here is a, uh, presumably a, a student and a student of the Constitution, I think, uh, what part of the Constitution allows for a dictatorship? Who can who can tell me that? I'll, I'll buy you a uh, a milkshake at Toomer's if you can tell me that. That's right. He got the right answer. There, there, is, there, is, there is no provision of the U.S. Constitution that allows for a, a dictatorship. Um, but, um, well, one book I'll mention is um, there's a man named Clinton Rossiter who taught, um, taught at um, Cornell for many, many years, decades, I think. Uh, he wrote a book called Constitutional Dictatorship, which sounds, uh, you know, in the American tradition, it sounds like an oxymoron. Kind of like uh, jumbo shrimp or military intelligence uh, <laughs> uh, and so forth, but uh, in constitutional dictatorship, he devoted a chapter to uh, called the Lincoln dictatorship, where he says this: uh, dictatorship played a decisive role in the North's successful effort to maintain the Union by force of arms. One man was the government of the United States. Lincoln was a great dictator and a true Democrat, and. Uh, and so th those are two words you don't usually put together, dictator and democrat, but that's, that's the sort of thing you run, in, run into in this literature. And he, he also went to say Lincoln's amazing disregard for the Constitution was considered by nobody as being legal, end quote. And so, and so I've read all this literature. You can read the, the history is out there. It doesn't make it into the textbooks that you use in high school or maybe even college. But the, uh, the scholarly works are out there like this. And when I uh, uh, debated one of the big shot Lincoln, uh, I call them idolaters, I don't call them scholars, uh, idolaters, uh, Harry Jaffa, he, he sort of angrily uh, uh, announced that Lincoln, Lincoln never did anything, anything that was unconstitutional, which is a flat contradiction of what generations of scholars uh, have said. And he didn't provide any explanation of why he thought that, but I'm gonna, I'm going to tell you why he was wrong, you know, with, uh, with some historical facts. Other authors have said similar things. James Randall, another book, if you're interested in this whole topic, is Constitutional Problems Under Lincoln by James Randall. Uh, James McPherson, the, uh, the well-known uh, historian at Princeton, uh, 
uh, calls Randall the, the preeminent uh, Lincoln scholar of the last generation. He wrote in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s for the most part. He was the uh, academic mentor of David Donald, who was a, a well, another well-known uh, Lincoln biographer, won the Pulitzer Prize for his book on Lincoln. But here's what uh, Randall says. He says, if Lincoln was a dictator, it must be admitted that he was a benevolent dictator. So it must, it, doesn't, it doesn't say why it must be admitted. Uh, you know, when I read that, I, I had a vision of James Randall pointing a gun at me, saying, "It must be admitted. It must be admitted." He was, a, but I, there's no explanation why it must uh, be like that. He, he wishes he was a benevolent dictator. But I would think that if you asked somebody in, say, South Carolina in 1865, if Lincoln was a benevolent dictator, he would probably disagree with James Randall. Um, so in another book that uh, talks about the Lincoln dictatorship is Freedom Under Lincoln by Dean Sprague. And uh, also, I mentioned this yesterday, Emancipating Slaves and Slaving Free Men by Jeffrey Hummel uh, surveys some of this literature. And the, the, the uh, preeminent scholar of the, uh, the Copperheads, the, the Northern Opposition, is uh, Frank Clement, K-L-E-M-E-N-T. And uh, he wrote a book called Lincoln's Critics, and it contains um, a couple of chapters on civil liberties issues uh, during the war. So that's, as far as you know, constitutional issues, that's another good source. Yeah, he has a good uh, discussion of that. So the question is, why is it that all these um, generations of scholars, and these are all pro-Lincoln scholars, by the way. In uh, um, my favorite book in, in, of all of these is uh, Freedom Under Lincoln because of the information that's in it by Dean Sprague. But still, the last chapter is called Lincoln the Humanitarian. So he, go, he writes a whole book about the trashing of the Constitution. And then the last chapter is, is why it was a good thing that, that he did this. He's a great humanitarian. Uh, why do they do this? Why have they said these things? Um, well, among the things uh, that, that he did was to launch a military invasion without the consent of Congress. First of all, uh, you know, it wasn't George W. Bush was not the first person, first president uh, to do that. Um, he blockaded southern ports without first declaring war, and he unilaterally suspended the writ of habeas corpus for the uh, that uh, the Congress eventually came around and and um, played its role in suspending habeas corpus. Now, of course, what habeas corpus is is what gives American citizens due process. If you're accused of a crime, you have a right to confront your accuser. You have a right to a, to a, a, a speedy trial and, and so forth. Uh, but when that is lifted, you know, Lincoln just announced that this was uh, no longer to be. Then the military could arrest anybody without even telling that person why, and then it could drag them off, and they did not feel obligated even to tell their family or, or anybody where they were. So there were some people who were dragged off and thrown into prison uh, by the Lincoln administration, who their families had no idea what happened to them for months, months and months at a time, and over a year in, in some cases. And so uh, that was the suspension of habeas corpus. And um, there were, uh, William Seward, the uh, Secretary of State, was put in charge of a secret police force, and there were thousands of these people who were spies. It was sort of like in Eastern Europe uh, during the, on the, under the Soviet bloc, where people would. Uh, would spy on uh, on their fellow citizens, and if they were overheard saying something that was uh, uh, construed as being not uh, friendly toward the Lincoln administration, uh, then they could be hauled off in jail. And as I told you yesterday, in uh, one of Lincoln's speeches, he actually said that if a conversation is being held about his policies, the war, and so forth, and, and a man remained silent and didn't say anything, he considered that to be treasonous. And so, uh, and so the word treasonous had a very broad definition during this time, and it, it essentially meant disagreement with Abraham Lincoln. Uh, it wasn't disagreement with the Constitution, per se, but him and his policies is, is how they, they pretty much defined treason, you know, remaining silent. Um, Dean Sprague says this about this whole process. The laws were silent, indictments were not found, testimony was not taken, judges did not sit, Juries were not impaneled, convictions were not obtained, and sentences were not pronounced. The Anglo-Saxon concept of due process, perhaps the greatest political triumph of the ages, and the best guardian of freedom, was abandoned. End quote. 
And as I said, there were thousands of political prisoners in various places like Fort Lafayette and New York Harbor. And Sprague said that uh, uh, it's sort of strange that the only place in the northern states where there was genuine free speech was in Fort Lafayette. Because once you're in prison for, for speaking freely, what have you got to lose? What are they going to do, put you back in prison? You're, you're already there. And so, uh, so uh, men could speak, and women could speak freely if they were in one of the, uh, these gulags um, that, were, that the Lincoln administration administered. And these were not uh, spies and traitors, uh, as, as you may have read somewhere else. Uh, there may have been some spies uh, in there, but they were all northern citizens, uh, included the mayor of Baltimore, Congressman Henry May from Maryland, about 20 members of the Maryland legislature were thrown in this prison, newspaper editors uh, from all over the country, uh, ordinary people, um, so it was, it was a lot of people like that. Uh, hundreds of newspapers were shut down. According to James Randall, uh, he mentions uh, over 300 of newspapers were shut down. And what was uh, what was usually happened was uh, they were they were shut down, or they were denied the use of the mail. And in those days, newspapers were all delivered by mail. There were no paper boys or paper girls. In, in those days, they were delivered by mail. So if you can't use the mail, the the government monopoly in mail, then you can't have a newspaper. And that's a that's a good argument against the government monopoly on mail. And uh, which is why I'm going to mention in a little bit uh, Lysander Spooner, by the way, and his his uh, comments on all of this. And one of the things he is known for is, uh, is trying to break up the government mail monopoly. He started up a private mail service and underpriced the government mail monopoly. Uh, it was illegal to do that, but he, but he gave it a try. So these, these newspapers were shut down. Now imagine this. Imagine if George W. Bush issued this order to one of his military generals, which is not too hard for me to imagine. But uh, imagine he said this. Um, uh, you, the general, you will take possession by military force of the printing establishments of the New York Times and the Washington Post and prohibit any further publication thereof. You are therefore commanded forthwith to arrest and imprison the editors, proprietors, and publishers of the aforesaid newspapers, end quote. Now, wouldn't you think that would be a, a, a horrible affront to uh, freedom of speech, the president of the United States ordering a military general to shut down uh, some of the biggest newspapers in the country and, and put the editors and owners in jail? Uh, well, of course. Uh, well, what I was reading was um, an exact order given to General John Dix by Lincoln, but I substituted uh, Washington Post and New York Times for the New York World and the Journal of Commerce, which were two big New York City newspapers at the time. So this is the sort of thing that went on. The generals were giving these orders. There were also mobs of uh, Republican Party uh, uh, hacks, uh, and sometimes including soldiers, who would literally destroy the printing presses. And I, I mentioned a, a, a new book yesterday. There's a new book called Lincoln's Wrath that I reviewed on LewRockwell.com uh, a month or so ago. If, you, uh, if you're interested in this whole topic, it's written by a, a, a journalist and a historian who just got interested in this, uh, this whole topic. And it centers on events in Pennsylvania, uh, but it also has uh, some nationwide implications. And I was, uh, was happy to see that. It's the first book that I know of in probably 25 years or so uh, by scholars that have actually uh, you know, taken on this whole issue of uh, the uh, demolition of civil liberties during the Lincoln administration. And, uh, and his wrath was the shutting down of all the newspapers the opposition press. And you know, one, of the, one reason why this is important is it, it abolishes the myth of northern unity during the war. All the textbooks will talk about the great unity there supposedly was. Well, well, uh, well of course, if you, if you jail all the opposition, then whoever's left is going to be pretty unified. Uh, and, so, uh, and this, of course, had a big censorship. You know, a lot of newspapers uh, who weren't shut down, that weren't shut down, got the message. They didn't have to shut down every last newspaper in America. They just had to rough up a few of the owners and editors of the bigger ones and make sure everyone knew about this, and that would intimidate everybody else uh, away from uh, speaking up against uh, the Lincoln administration. And so you can find, uh, can find some criticisms in northern newspapers at this time, but uh, the thing is you don't know that maybe a week later Seward showed up or one of his secret police and shut them down. Uh, I was in a debate with a um, Lincoln idolater in, uh, from 
uh, North Carolina State University in Richmond, and he thought he found proof that I was lying about all this. And he found one newspaper uh, in, the, in Ohio, I think it was, that he found that had a criticism of, of the Lincoln administration, and he used, thought that was proof that this, this is all a myth. They didn't shut down newspapers, and, uh, which is ridiculous. You know, they probably, a couple of weeks later, they probably did, uh, that very newspaper, as far as we know, but that was how they operated. Uh, all, all telegraph communication was censored. This kind of reminds me of the Bush administration's domestic spying program. We use, you know, we have high technology now, but censoring the telegraphs uh, achieved the same thing, listening in on everybody's messages. The railroads were nationalized. Federal troops were ordered to interfere with northern elections. And this happened quite a bit. That were, federal troops would um, uh, f flood into an area and, and instruct it to vote Republican to make sure that the Republican candidate would win. Uh, Lincoln was known to have his generals um, uh, furlough uh, uh, soldiers uh, to go and vote if, if they were Republican, keep, keep the Democrats out in the field, that, that sort of thing. And in my book, I, I cite um, David Donald, the Lincoln biographer, as saying that Lincoln won New York State in the 1864 election by 7,000 votes, quote, with the help of federal bayonets. End quote. So they literally intimidated uh, the Democrat voters with bayonets. They sometimes used different color ballots. The Democrat ballot would be one color and the uh, Republican would be another, another color. Today, maybe the Republican ballot would be red and the, the uh, Democrat would be blue. So the soldiers would know who to intimidate. If you had a, you know, a certain color ballot in your hand, they, they, would, they would intimidate you out of uh, voting. Um, we mentioned, mentioned yesterday that um, somebody asked about uh, Clement Vallandigham, uh, the congressman from Ohio, and I mentioned that uh, this was another affront to the Constitution and that, you know, one of the essential elements of the Constitution is supposed to be the, um, the separation of powers. And so here is the president uh, essentially deporting the most outspoken member of Congress, Clement Vallandigham uh, of Ohio, it's from Dayton, Ohio. And I mentioned how 67 armed federal soldiers broke into his home in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, one of the best renditions of this story is in that book by Frank Clement that I mentioned, called Lincoln's Critics. But I thought it'd be worthwhile uh, reading to you a few things that Vallandigham said that got him in trouble. It got him in trouble. Uh, he was a congressman who made speeches uh, criticizing all of these acts that I've been talking about on the House of, floor of the House of Representatives. And then it, when he, uh, he retired from Congress to run for governor of Ohio, he went back home to Dayton and said many of the same things. And the Lincoln administration accused him of uh, discouraging enlistments in the army or encouraging uh, desertion by, by criticizing the government. But think of it in today's context. If you're, if you're, that would mean if a politician like Ron Paul is out there criticizing the war in Iraq, the argument would be made, well, he's encouraging desertion because these soldiers may be listening, reading Ron Paul's speeches on lourockwell.com. You know, they've got the internet over there in Iraq. And that's the same kind of thing that was, go that was going on. What was he saying? Well, here, here are some of the things. In fact, there's a whole book of the Land of Gam speeches that's been uh, published by a Crown Rights Publishing Company. Um, he said that Lincoln's first inaugural address was, quote, spoken with the forked tongue and crooked counsel of the New York politician leaving 30 millions of people in doubt whether it meant peace or war, end quote. So uh, you can see how that would have gotten under Lincoln's skin. Um, he denounced uh, the tariff, the moral tariff, which we talked about yesterday as, quote, obscure, ill-considered, ill-digested, and unstatesmanlike. He condemned the, the whole administration for its, quote, persistent infractions of the Constitution, its high-minded usurpations of power, uh, which formed any part of a deliberate conspiracy to overthrow the present form of federal Republican government and to establish a strong centralized government in its stead, end quote. Uh, he also went on to say he called this, this uh, the administration wicked and cunning, and he said starting a war without the consent of Congress was the kind of dictatorial act that would have cost any English sovereign his head at any time within the last 200 years. So he was, he was a fiery orator, if you will, um, uh, to say the least. Um, we don't have anybody like this anymore. Uh, then he went on to say, 
uh, condemning Lincoln for the quartering of soldiers in private homes without the consent of owners. That's one of the things that was mentioned in the Declaration of Independence and the, the train of abuses uh, by uh, Jefferson. And without any manner having been prescribed by law to the subversion in part, at least, of Maryland, of her own state government and of the authorities under it, to the censorship over the telegraph and the infringement repeatedly in one or more of the states of the right of the people to keep and bear arms for their defense, free speech too has been repeatedly denied." End quote. That was Vallandigam again. And finally, uh, and this is, this is, in my view, this is what really had to be stopped. Vallandigam was letting the cat out of the bag. He, he was going all over the place saying things like this, that the purpose of the war, he was saying, was, quote, national banks, bankrupt laws, a vast and per permanent re public debt, high tariffs, heavy direct taxation, enormous expenditure, gigantic and stupendous peculation. Peculation means stealing or embezzling. And strong government. No more state lines, no more state governments, and a consolidated monarchy or vast centralized military despotism, uh, end quote. That's what uh, Vallandigam was saying was the real purpose of the war, to establish all of that. And so, and so for, for doing this, he was accused of treason. And, uh, and, and as I said, they, they wanted to make a big show of handing him over to a, the Confederate army in Tennessee. But the Confederates said, uh, who is this guy? Uh, get rid of him. They didn't want him. And he ended up in, uh, in Canada, in, in exile in Canada. Uh, the border states were systematically disarmed in violation of the Second Amendment. In fact, you can make an argument that the whole invasion of the southern states was an abolition of the Second Amendment, because if you understand James Madison's rationale for the Second, Second Amendment, it was that so an, an armed populace would be a deterrent to a federal, a central government invasion that would uh, deprive them of their liberties. That was the whole purpose of an armed populace, according to James Madison. And so the, the, uh, the, uh, the disarmament of uh, the border states uh, did this. It, uh, it disarmed them and it allowed them to come and run roughshod over the whole country. Uh, there were two confiscation acts passed by the Lincoln administration that allowed for the confiscation of private property of uh, dissenters, essentially. And they included lines like this. Uh, any, any U.S. citizen, this applied to the citizens of the North as well as anywhere else. And keep in mind, uh, Lincoln never, uh, never uh, said that the southern states had legally seceded. He always considered them to be part of the United States and that all the people to be citizens of the United States. And so if a federal law was passed, he, they always considered that this applies to everyone, North and, North and South. But um, these confiscations confiscation acts, a U.S. citizen could have all of his private property confiscated for such crimes as, and I'm quoting directly from the law, falsely exalting the motives of the traitors. Falsely exalting the motives of the traitors. So if, if you were to, if somebody were to say, well, you know, if you read the Declaration of Independence, it says uh, governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed. And these Southerners are saying, we no longer consent to being governed by Washington, D.C. So maybe they have a point. In fact, uh, in my book, I talk about how the majority of the northern newspapers said this at the time. But with the confiscation laws that were passed, that would be a crime, and you could have all of your property confiscated by the state by, by saying that, by saying something like that, by exa falsely exalting the motives of the traitors. So... Um, you know, no free speech there. Or this, this is a, the exact words of the law, overstating the success of our adversaries. If you were heard to overstate the success of, uh, of, the, of the, other, the Confederate Army, you could be hauled into prison and, uh, and uh, have all your property confiscated. Like if, if in uh, 1861, this law passed after that, but if, if someone were to say something like, damn, we really got our butts kicked at Manassas, didn't we? And uh, I suppose that would qualify as overstating the success of our adversaries and you could uh, have all your property. Or this, uh, this is another, the exact wording of the law, inflaming party spirit among ourselves. No party dispirit permitted. What party could that be? I would guess the Republican Party would be my guess, uh, party spirit among ourselves. And uh, there was a charming little part of this law uh, that said, that uh, informers, 
who turned in their neighbors or whoever, you turn somebody in, and they were prosecuted. They did have a, a due process uh, after a while uh, when the, with these cases. If they were convicted, you, the informer, could keep 50% of that person's property. And so that was a, so they understood incentives. I guess they understood incentives like we economists do uh, back in those days. And so this was, you know, very similar uh, to uh, the com totalitarian communism uh, that uh, we've all learned about in the, during the 20th century. Uh, countries like Albania and places like that, uh, Bulgaria, um, very similar. Okay, and so these are these are some of the things that. Um, that uh, are the reasons why the, all these historians I mentioned refer to the Lincoln dictatorship. And uh, for a long time, if you get into this literature, you'll find that uh, a lot of historians have praised uh, Lincoln for this, have praised him for this. In, uh, in Constitutional under Pro Problems Under Lincoln, James Randall devotes hundreds and hundreds of pages to describing what happened. And, and I, I encourage you to read this book if you're interested in this topic. It's really well worth it. It's a very big, it's about this thick, the big fat book. But then he makes excuses for it all at the end by saying things like, great social purposes can be promoted by abandoning constitutional barriers. And so, uh, you know, why do we have constitutional barriers if great social purposes can, uh, can be uh, promoted by abandoning them? them? Um, you know, when I mentioned also that um, Lincoln's suspension of habeas corpus, uh, and Congress then went along with it. He did it unilaterally. Uh, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Roger B. Taney, uh, did, did uh, issue a ruling that this was unconstitutional, and his reasoning was very sound. His reasoning was the Constitution uh, talks about the suspension of habeas corpus in the section on uh, congressional powers, not executive powers, he, he, he went back to British law as well as American, as well as American law. It is very clear that the president cannot uh, unilaterally uh, do this in Taney's view. And uh, Lincoln's response, which I'm going to talk about shortly, was to issue an arrest warrant for the chief justice. Uh, so uh, demolishing the other side of the, uh, the separation of powers by intimidating the Supreme Court. And, but after the war in 1866, the United States Supreme Court issued a, uh, a ruling that uh, neither branch can legally suspend habeas corpus as long as the civil courts are operating. And so, in fact, in this decision in 1866, they made the argument that uh, an, a crisis like a war, like a war, is the most important time of all to keep the Constitution intact. It's just the opposite of this argument that you often hear that, well, this is an emergency, things are different. For example, if you were to listen to Rush Limbaugh or Sean Hannity talk uh, on this topic, they, they'll repeat ad nauseum. Everything has changed since 9-11. What they're saying is if the Bush administration wants to suspend habeas corpus, torture prisoners, spy on us, that's okay. Everything has changed. Well, uh, in 1866, I think the Supreme Court did get it right by saying if the purpose of this Constitution is to protect uh, the liberty of the people, that's the most important time of all in times of emergency or war to enforce the Constitution, not to suspend it. If not, you know, governments will constantly be fabricating crises. They're talking about phony crises to justify watering down the Constitution and grabbing more power and destroying more liberty. And they understood that back then. But, uh, but you know, who, who expects Rush Limbaugh or Sean Hannity to understand this? That's, that's, and I wouldn't. So, uh, so Randall went on to say that the Constitution should be looked at as a vehicle of life and a matter of growth, development, and interpretation. Uh, and he sort of uh, denigrated the founding fathers by saying, we should not tolerate excessive reliance upon the political wisdom of a bygone generation. And so that was sort of, uh, he was a so-called progressive, Randall was, and so that was sort of a way of uh, defining what, what, what's called the living constitution. And uh, I, I, uh, more recently, there's a, a man named George P. Fletcher who wrote a book on, uh, called Lincoln's Constitution. And I was kind of surprised by this title because I didn't know Lincoln had his own constitution. I, had, I always thought we had one for all of us, but apparently he had his own. And he comes right out and says that um, he praises 
what he calls Lincoln's casual attitude toward formal constitutional institutions. Casual attitude. Uh, and why does he praise this? He says, well, because uh, this, this did lead in the decades after the war to uh, nationalism, egalitarianism, and democracy. It made those things much easier to achieve. And that, of course, is a definition of socialism, as far as I'm concerned. Nationalism, egalitarianism, maybe a fascism and socialism combined. And in my book, I contrast this to what George Washington had to say about uh, this sort of thing, this casual attitude toward the, uh, the Constitution. In his farewell address, he said, if the Constitution is to be altered, he said, quote, let it be corrected by an amendment in the way in which the Constitution designates. There is a process for this. And then he goes on to say, but let there be no change by usurpation, for though this in one instance may be the instrument of good, it is the customary weapon by which free governments are destroyed. So you might agree with it now. You might think that, well, let's let George W. Bush uh, 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 violate the Constitution uh, in, in this or that way. But, but, and, and you might think it's a good thing now. But who's to say there won't be a tyrant in office next year? Uh, who will who will not be quite as quite as benevolent? Now on the on the business of uh, Judge Taney and uh, the suspension of habeas corpus. Uh, you know I didn't actually I didn't go in my in the real Lincoln I didn't uh, mention this on purpose because I knew that there was a lot of dispute over this and at the time I only knew of one source of the story that Lincoln issued an arrest warrant. All I mentioned was that uh, Taney did issue a, 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 a statement that this was unconstitutional, but I didn't say in the book that Lincoln issued the arrest warrant uh, because the first source was a, uh, a, a book by Ward Lehman, who was uh, Lincoln's close friend, law partner, and he worked in the White House in the Lincoln administration, who, who said this. He wrote a, 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 a biography, and, uh, and, and he said this. He said that Lincoln issued the, an arrest warrant for the chief justice. And so the Lincoln cult, or the Lincoln idolaters, as I, as I call them, they respond to this by saying, well, Ward Lehman was a drunk. You can't believe him. And, you know, how could you disprove that? I mean, he's a drunk. Uh, they also acknowledge that Ulysses S. Grant was a notorious drunk, but they don't question much of what he says. But they said, well, he, he's a drunk. And, that, and, that, and usually, you know, with the Lincoln uh, cult, that's sufficient. Personal, uh, personal smear, ignore him. Okay, that's the way they, they operate. But since then, I've uncovered several other sources that are much better than Ward Lehman's, and uh, not that I buy the drunk explanation. I think Ward Lehman was, was right on in, in what he said. Um, in fact, uh, Charles Adams, who wrote the, the excellent book, When in the Course of Human Events, tried to get a copy of the manuscript of Ward Lehman's book, which is on microfilm and at the Huntington Library. And they wouldn't allow him. They apparently knew who he was, and so they wouldn't give him access to it. However, a graduate student at George Mason uh, about two years ago is uh, doing research on the whole tariff issue, Lincoln and the tariff issue, dissertation research. Uh, he has got a copy of it. Uh, they did, he's, a, he's an unknown graduate student. They don't know who he is. So he got, he got the actual thing from the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Huntington Library. And uh, the last I heard from him, He's trying to get somebody to put it on the internet, the whole thing, because yeah, it's on microfilm now. It has to be transferred from microfilm to the internet, so the whole thing might be, it might be out there. But another source is uh, George W. Brown, the wartime mayor of Baltimore. He wrote a, a book called Baltimore on the 19th of April, 1861, where he talks about this. He talks about a, a conversation he had with Judge, uh, Judge Taney and uh, where Judge Taney told him that he, he, the judge, knew about the arrest warrant for him in response to his, his opinion, his opinion. And uh, there's a, by the way, about, about a mile down Charles Street from my office is a big statue of uh, Roger B. Taney. He's, he's a Baltimore uh, native. Uh, another one, another source, is a book called A Memoir of Benjamin Robbins Curtis. Benjamin Robbins Curtis was on the United States Supreme Court he defended Andrew Johnson in his impeachment trial. He, was, he wrote the dissenting opinion in the Dred Scott case and resigned from the court over the Dred Scott case. And, uh, but, but nevertheless, he refers to the arrest warrant for the Chief Justice as, quote, a great crime, a great crime in his memoirs. 
So that's uh, yet another source. So I think these are uh, unimpeachable sources, as far as sources go, uh, that this did happen. Uh, you know, the Lincoln administration could have appealed this, this opinion. They could have gone to court, but they chose not to. They chose uh, to just ignore it and to continue to suspend habeas corpus. And another thing that I found that was going on here was not just the intimidation of Judge Taney, but the intimidation of many judges, federal judges, who were attempting to issue writs of habeas corpus to uh, four people that were accused of uh, being traitors by simply disagreeing with the Lincoln administration. And here's something I dug up, and I'm, this is all in my forthcoming book that's going to be published in October. But I, what I dug up was uh, a... Um, I'll, if anybody's interested, I can give you the actual uh, law case citations for this. But there was an, a, a judge, in, a federal judge in Washington, D.C. His name was W.M. Merrick, M-E-R-R-I-C-K. And he was going to court the next day, and he was going to issue a writ of habeas corpus to uh, some young man that had been accused of criticizing the Lincoln administration. And here's what he said. In a, he, this is a letter that he wrote to his fellow judges on the federal district court in Washington, D.C., uh, as to why he did not show up in court that day. He never made it. He says this, uh, quote, After dinner, I visited my brother judges in, in Georgetown, and returning home between half past seven and eight o'clock, found an armed sentinel stationed at my door by order of the provost marshal. I learned that this guard had been placed at my door as early as five o'clock, Armed sentries from that time continuously until now have been stationed in front of my house. Thus it appears that a military officer against whom a writ in the appointed form of law has first threatened with and afterwards arrested and imprisoned the attorney who rightfully served the writ upon him. So they arrested the attorney who served the writ. He continued and still continues in contempt and disregard of the mandate of the law and has ig ignominiously placed an armed guard to insult and intimidate by its presence the judge who ordered the writ to issue. So they had armed guards stationed outside of the house of the judge so that he couldn't leave and go to court and issue writs of habeas corpus. And I found that numerous instances like this in several different law cases and, and, uh, and things. So this apparently was going on not just with the Chief Justice. And as far as the Constitution goes, this is another, another attack on the separation of powers because uh, it's the intimidation of judges. And, uh, and like I said, with the newspaper, you don't have to intimidate every last judge in America. Just a few well-publicized uh, acts of tyranny will do. It will intimidate most of them, uh, who, you know, they, because they, they, they eventually found out what happened to Volandigam and, uh, and to judge, about Judge Taney's arrest warrant. If, if he's willing to uh, arrest the Chief Justice, he'll arrest anybody. And the final thing I want to mention here uh, with regard to the, the Constitution, and then, then, I want to, then I want to say something about uh, Lysander Spooner and his take on all of this, was that uh, there, was, there has been a, a, a myth that has been created to justify all of this uh, and uh, to justify the, really the perversion of the Constitution. And the perversion of the Constitution that I'm referring to is the supposed illegality of secession. And uh, I'm going to talk more about this in my next lecture on states' rights. But all I'll say about it for now is that the states uh, were sovereign. They, they did hold conventions to ratify or not ratify the United States Constitution. And uh, New York, Rhode Island, and Virginia, as conditions of ratifying the Constitution, reserve the right to withdraw at any future date if, the, uh, if this new central government became abusive of their liberties. And they were all three accepted into the Union with that understanding. And under the Constitution, no state has more, more powers or more, more rights than any other state. So that if they accepted those three in, then uh, I think it, was, it had to have been presumed that all the states would have this right to withdraw from the Union if they wanted to. Uh, uh, in some future date if, the, if they decided the, uh, the government was abusive of their liberties. And, uh, and the idea that they had to get the permission of all the other states, I think, is, uh, is kind of absurd because if you have a right of secession, 
uh, you don't have a right of secession if it's subject to other, somebody else's approval. Either you have that right or you don't. But if it's subject to somebody else's approval, you don't have that right. Um, further evidence that it was understood that states had a right to secede was in the weeks after Lincoln's inauguration, there were three bills put before Congress to make secession illegal. And so why would they propose legislation to make secession illegal if they thought it was already illegal? Well, obviously, they didn't think. The U.S. Congress didn't think it was illegal. They thought it was perfectly legal for that to happen. And so the whole invasion, the whole invasion of the southern states, uh, I argue, is, uh, it was unconstitutional, illegal, violation of the Constitution, and that the, uh, the South was on, in the right. And that is probably also why they never brought Jefferson Davis to trial after the war. They destroyed the right of secession at gunpoint, but then they held him in prison for several years, Jefferson Davis, after the war, but they never brought him to trial. Uh, a man named Frank O'Connor, who was a, a well-known New York lawyer, offered to defend uh, Davis, and that was apparently enough to intimidate the entire U.S. government out of going to trial because they didn't want to resurrect the right of secession in the courts after destroying it on the battlefield. And so, uh, so I think that's further evidence that, that uh, they did have this right. But there's a whole uh, body of theory that has been developed to, to rationalize this, to rationalize the notion that there never was anything such thing as state sovereignty. And, uh, and this theory actually developed before Lincoln. It was developed by Daniel Webster and then Joseph Story, the uh, Supreme Court Justice, also popularized this, this notion. And it was the notion that the Constitution was created by the whole people. Um, if you read, an, uh, if you read a, uh, Alan Key's speech, you'll probably see the words the whole people in there. And, you, and if you're wondering, what the heck is he talking about? The whole people, the half people, the quarter people? This is what he's talking about. He's talking about nationalism, nationalism, the whole people. Uh, you know, if this were true, if the whole people created the government, the Constitution, then the states were never sovereign. It was this thing called the whole people that, that were sovereign. Uh, James J. Kilpatrick, who was a syndicated columnist, he retired some years ago. Uh, he, was a, he, was a, he was an excellent writer. Um, and he wrote a book called The Sovereign States. And he says this about this idea. He says, the delusion that sovereignty is vested in the whole people of the United States is one of the strangest misconceptions of our public life. You know, where does this come from? Well, one of the things the modern proponents point to is the preamble of the Constitution, which, which says, we, the people of the United States, do ordain and establish this Constitution. And so they, they will usually say, aha, there it is. That's the whole people, we, the people. Well, if you read James Madison's notes on the, of the debates in the federal Constitution, which is the source uh, that we have of what went on during the Constitution, what you will learn is that the reason why it says we the people in the preamble to the Constitution is that when they proposed the Constitution, they originally had a different preamble. The preamble originally read this, I'm quoting it, we the people of the states of New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Providence Plantations, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia, do ordain, declare, and establish the following constitution, uh, and, and so forth. But then they realized, well, wait a minute. We don't know that all these states are going to ratify. How can we put them all in the preamble? Some of them may vote no. So let's just leave it at we the people of the United States. So, that, so that's what they did. That's what they did. But it was understood by everyone that the states were sovereign. And, uh, and when they talked about we the people of the states, they didn't mean state legislatures. They meant the citizens of the states. That, that's who's sovereign. We are creating this central government as our agent. That's what they were saying. James Madison himself, everyone calls the father of the Constitution, was very clear on where sovereignty resided. It wasn't the whole people. Here's what he said in, in his notes on ratification. He says, the, the Constitution would be ratified by the people, I'm quoting, the people composing those political societies in their highest sovereign capacity, the political societies of the states, is what he's referring to. And so it was, not the, it was not state governments, as I said, but the citizens of the states. So even James Madison was very clear on that. 
And so it's hard to understand how anyone could uh, honestly make this argument that something called the whole people. There was never any national referendum on the, on the Constitution. That never happened. North Carolina took well, well over a year to ratify the Constitution. And the, the way the ratification went, it only required nine states. And so the nine states voted, and they, they had a new Constitution. And North Carolina waited another year or so before they went in. But believe it or not, nobody at the time suggested that North Carolina be invaded and one out of, and, and, and a one out of four men of military age be killed and the cities burned down. Honest to God, that didn't happen. Everyone how was the opinion, well, they're a separate country. Leave them alone. Good luck to them. There, there, was, no, there was no talk about the perpetual union and, uh, and, and all that, you know, you know, an, an invasion. It was, it was accepted by everyone, and that's their choice. Um, uh, when Lincoln uh, gave the Gettysburg Address, when he said a new nation was created, not true. They didn't create a new nation in 1776. They created a confederacy. They created a confederacy of states. Um, and, and the very words of the Declaration of Independence uh, contradict this theory about the whole people. Just read it. Um, the, someone asked yesterday about the Straussians. Uh, they, they tend to harp on a few words of the Declaration. They claim to be the experts on the Declaration of Independence. And they, 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 they focus on the, uh, the all men are created equal uh, language. And they have, they have their own unique definition of equal. Uh, also, we can talk about that later. But they tend to ignore the rest of the Declaration. If you read the rest of it, uh, well, first of all, it was a declaration of secession from the British Empire. That's what it was. It wasn't a declaration of revolution. It was a declaration of secession. They used the word separation from the, the British Empire. And the, uh, the, the founders were all secessionists, every one of them. They, were all, they, they fought a war of secession from the British Empire. It was the loyalists, like Benedict Arnold, who were the traitors. It was, so it was the anti-secessionists who were the traitors in the American Revolution, not the other way around. And, and the Declaration is a statement of state sovereignty. Just, just read it. Here's what it says. It says, these colonies are, and of right ought to be, free and independent states. Uh, they have full power to levy war and conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and to do all other acts and things which independent states may have right do. So they thought of themselves as separate countries. In fact, until the 1860s, it was common for Americans to refer to their state as my country. When, this, when the American Revolution ended, the King of England signed a peace treaty with the individual states. There, there was no such thing called the United States of America that, that was involved in the peace treaty with the King of England at the end of the American Revolution. And in every one of the founding documents, the, the U.S. Constitution, the Articles of Confederation, the Declaration of Independence, uh, the word United States is always in the plural, okay? It, it, meaning the states, the, in, the free and independent states are united in doing this. It doesn't say that there's some, uh, some uh, organization called the United States. It says the states which are united. That's, it's always in the plural, never in the singular in, in any of the founding documents. And in the treaty with Great Britain, it says this, His Britannic Majesty acknowledges the said United States, these New Hampshire, Massachusetts Bay, Rhode Island, Providence Plantations, Connecticut, on and on. He listed all the states, the colonies, individually. That's who he thought he was signing a peace treaty with, uh, not with something called the United States government. And so... Um, so anyway, but this, this idea that um, the whole people created uh, the Constitution is part of the, the myth that has been around since the days of Daniel Webster to justify a consolidated monopolistic government and to deny uh, uh, states' rights, essentially, state sovereignty. And the final thing I want to mention before I take questions is since, uh, since many of you know who Lysander Spooner is or what, who he was, uh, and even if you don't, I'd like to pique your interest he was a well-known uh, libertarian philosopher, legal scholar in the, uh, the mid and late 19th century. Uh, uh, there, there's a couple of good books of his readings, uh, uh, readings of Lysander Spooner that um, the Liberty Fund, I think, publishes one. The Foundation for Economic Education has published a, a couple of his uh, books of reading, readings. His, his essay, No Treason, is a, a famous libertarian uh, publication. 
And he was also a, an abolitionist from Massachusetts. And he wrote a book in, the 18, in 1845 called The Unconstitutionality of Slavery. He also wrote a book that was sort of a guide to lawyers for how to go about nullifying the fugitive slave law. So he was considered to be a hero to the abolition movement in the, in the, uh, from 1840s on in Massachusetts and throughout New England. And yet he really despised Lincoln and his entire administration. Uh, uh, and uh, I'd like to bring to your attention some of the things. Um, I dug up a letter that he wrote to William Seward um, in 1860. And I also dug up, I'm not going to mention both of them, an 1862 letter that he wrote to Senator Charles Sumner of Massachusetts, who was also one of the leading Republican big shots at the time. And uh, uh, Seward was known to have publicly admitted that Spooner's argument in his book, The Unconstitutionality of Slavery, was uh, impregnable. It was uh, unassailable. Uh, Sumner said that. And so Spooner wrote to him and said this, why then in heaven's name do you not take that position? You know, why don't you come out and say this? Uh, he accused him of only opposing slavery in the abstract, not in reality. And so, and he, and what Spooner believed was that had these people, Seward, Lincoln, Sumner, all these people who made all these grandiose speeches about liberty and freedom and condemning slavery, uh, uh, thought of it as, thought in terms of a practical way of ending slavery, they could have avoided the war. But all they wanted to do, in Spooner's view, was to talk about it only in the abstract, which everyone did. Everyone did. Uh, as I said yesterday, Robert E. Lee said slavery was a, uh, a moral and, uh, and uh, political evil wherever it was practiced. Everyone condemned it that way. But the thing was, why was it not possible for America to do what every other country on earth, the British, the Spanish, the French, the Danes, the Dutch, uh, did and end slavery peacefully through compensated emancipation of some kind? Uh, only in America was there a war where, uh, that was involved in the ending of slavery. And here's what uh, Spooner said about this. He said, had all those men at the North who believed these ideas, that is, the unconstitutionality of slavery, to be true, promulgated them as was their plain and obvious duty to do, it is reasonable to suppose that we should long since have freedom without shedding one drop of blood. So he was saying he thought this war was totally unnecessary and he didn't believe that the war was being fought to end slavery anyway. Spooner didn't. And he went on to say that the South could consistently and with honor and probably would long before this time and without a conflict have surrendered their slavery to the demand of the Constitution and to the moral sentiment of the world, you and others like you have done more according to your abilities to prevent the peaceful abolition of slavery than any other men in the nation. So Spooner uh, was not a friend of the Lincoln administration. He said even nastier things to Seward. And he was not finished. He went on to say, in your pretended zeal for liberty, you have been urging the nation to the most frightful destruction of human life. And through a series of years betrayed the very citadel of liberty which you were under oath to defend. There has been no other treason at all comparable with this. Treason to the Constitution is what he was, uh, he was referring to. And so in his, in his famous 1870 essay, No Treason, uh, Spooner wrote that uh, the war erupted for purely pecuniary considerations and not for any moral reason. Uh, he, he said that the war was being fought for northern bankers, manufacturers, and railroad corporations who he called lenders of blood money who had for a long series of years previous to the war been willing, willing accomplices of the slaveholders in perverting the government from the purpose of liberty and justice. And he was, he was really on a roll in this, in this article. On the, if anyone wants to read this, I'll give you the, uh, the web address. It's on the web and, uh, if you want to print it out or read the actual you know, article. And uh, he called Grant the chief murderer of the war in, in, in this essay. And, uh, he interpreted the crushing of the Southern secessionists as saying, here's what the government is saying, saying, submit quietly, submit quietly to all the robbery and slavery we have arranged for you, and you can have your peace. That's, that's Spooner's uh, rendition of what the U.S. government was, what the Lincoln administration was saying to the Southerners. Uh, 
And he went on to say that the Republicans did not end slavery as an act of justice to the black man himself, but only as a war measure. He said they did this because they wanted his, the black man's, assistance in carrying on the war they had undertaken for maintaining and intensifying that political, commercial, and industrial slavery. He was talking about the tariff primarily, industrial slavery. You see where he said it, it eventually enslaved everybody, north and south, uh, to pay to pay more for goods and services. Um, that's about enough uh, of Spooner. Spooner, you get the message of what Spooner's. I mean, he didn't like Lincoln and, and his administration. And uh, one, the final thing I'll mention about this in regard to Spooner is that after the war, uh, the deification of Lincoln occurred which sort of allowed Americans to accept all of this as a good thing, it still exists. And one good example of how this deification proceeded, uh, I have in my files, by the way, I have in my files uh, magazine articles, copies of magazine articles from the 1870s and 1880s that have pictures of Abe Lincoln uh, uh, being resurrected from his tomb with angel's wings. He's rising up to the, to the heavens and there's this tomb with a door open uh, on the bottom and this, this all throughout New England, this sort of thing happened. And here's what uh, a Unitarian minister named Henry Bellows said after the war was over. You know, or he said this: "The state is indeed divine as being the great incarnation of a nation's rights, privileges, honor, and life." End quote. So it, it wasn't just the deification of Lincoln; it was the deification of the state in general that that uh, we eventually got from the deification of Lincoln. And if you read this literature, read Harry Jaffa, for example. Uh, not too much, though. It'll make you sick. But um, he calls Lincoln Father Abraham. They compare him to Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, they say things like uh, Lincoln uh, uh, died for the sins of his country, just like Jesus died for the sins of the world. There's a book that was published last year called Redeemer Presidents. That's the theme, Redeemer President. He, He's redeeming our, our sins for us. Uh, uh, they compare him to Moses also. They say he led his people to the promised land but didn't make it there himself, just like Moses. And so they compare him to Father Abraham, Jesus Christ, Moses. Uh, and uh, and, and that, that began with the New England preachers of the late 19th century. And it continues today with the Claremont Institute and, uh, and, uh, and people who write books with titles like Redeemer President. Uh, that try to, uh, uh, and it's idol worship. Uh, someone asked me recently if I thought uh, Lincoln should be sandblasted off of Mount Rushmore. And uh, that's you know, a loaded question for me. But my answer was I think the whole thing should be blown up. I, I don't like the idea of any politician, you know, big, you know, stone head of any, whoever it is. Uh, it's, it's the deification of politics, no matter who it is. So I would sandblast all of them is my, is my answer. And maybe that's all I'll say for now. And maybe, uh, and I'll, I'll be glad to take questions, comments, brilliant commentary, or uh, snide remarks. Uh, doesn't matter. Okay. Anybody have any burning questions uh, on their mind? Uh, well, treason was what was always stated. Treason if, uh, uh, was. Uh, was the the idea? Pardon? It was it was an opinion that he issued as a circuit court judge. Uh, in those days, Supreme Court judges also had duties as circuit court judges, and he was in that circuit around D.C., Baltimore, and he issued this opinion because this is where this was going on. They were arresting the Maryland legislature and not arresting them, imprisoning them. There were no charges ever filed and that sort of thing. And they simply said it was treasonous to, uh, to stop them from doing that because they, they considered it, the people they were imprisoning as, as uh, traitors, spies, uh, the enemy. And so if you're aiding the enemy by stopping us from doing this, they are, this is an act of treason. And so that's, that's what they accused all of these people of, of being uh, one way or another, including Judge Taney. You know, it, seems, it seems outlandish and unbelievable today, but it's, it, this is all uh, part of the historical record. Is it the same way for the papers? Yeah, it's the same way for the newspaper editors. Um, so you have to understand that, that Lincoln, he, had, he identified himself as the Union. So you criticize me, you're criticizing the Union. 
and and he made a some sort of sacred thing out of the union. But you know, m most people at the time the war broke out thought, well, this union is a convenient uh, arrangement whereby uh, uh, we can provide for, say, the national defense in case of an invasion, and uh, and, uh, and and if we all band together, we have a better chance of keep uh, fending off a military invasion by some foreign power than if we all act individually. So we have these few delegated powers we're going to give this central government, but they didn't think of it like, like Lincoln did with. He made speeches about the mystic cords of memory is what tie the union together and, and things like this. So he used this religious language and sort of uh, psychic language, uh, actually, to, to talk about this union. But most Americans didn't think of the union that way at the time. That was, that was, that was propaganda to, to justify what they were doing, the crushing of the secession movement. And so, uh, and, and so he did identify the union with himself, I think. And uh, so if you criticize me, you're criticizing the union, and this is this glorious thing. Uh, the whole idea of the perpetual union, you know, the, the Articles of Confederation, the official title was the Articles of Confederation and Perpetual Union. Then when the states seceded from that and adopted the Constitution, they dropped the words perpetual union. It's not in the Constitution. And uh, they, they, they said something about a more perfect union, but that doesn't mean uh, a perpetual union uh, and that uh, we will kill you if you, if you leave. It doesn't, that was never the understanding. Uh, you know, the, the Constitution was barely ratified by a hair as it was. What chances would there have been of it ever being ratified if it was understood that you could never leave under any circumstances, no matter how tyrannical the central government became. No one would have, no, that would never have been ratified like that. But that, yet that was Lincoln's theory of what, what uh, went on at the ratification of the Constitution. That was his theory of the understanding that the whole people decided that after fighting a war of secession, a revolution, uh, a war of secession against the tyrannical government, they would tie themselves to ever, forever, for a new, to a different central government that they were sure would never be uh, abusive of liberty. And that's, uh, that's just uh, too tall a tale to believe. But, yes, um, you mentioned specific acts done in Maryland. Um, you know, freedoms. Were other specific acts done in other parts oh, of sure. Kentucky, Missouri? Can you give specific examples of that? Uh, yeah, I do in my writings. Uh, this sort of well, this sort of thing went all over. Um, I could cite Dean Sprague again. I guess is, is talking about how wide this was, uh, how widely spread this was. Uh, it was everywhere. Let's see. Well, the newspapers that were shut down, I, in my writings, I list them from all over the country. It wasn't just the New York City newspapers. It was, it was everywhere. Well, I, I'm not going to spend time looking through the index uh, here. But what, one of the statements Dean Sprague made was that he, was, he, he talked about uh, what this meant for governmental power. He said, yeah, I can paraphrase him. I don't have to exact quote, he said, Father Abraham was born. It was the last line of this quotation of his I'm thinking of. And he was saying that when the U.S. government could snatch a man from Maine from his home for criticizing it and then do the same to another man from Pennsylvania or Ohio, then it demonstrated that it had real power, whereas previous to this, it didn't have that kind of real power. At the time the war broke out, the average American paid about $45 a year in taxes, and the only contact he or she ever had with the central government was through the post office. So it was pretty much, in terms of the central government, a libertarian society that the government was local, and the central government, uh, there wasn't even a standing army uh, to speak of. A few thousand troops in the Indian forts here and there, and it was, but it was minuscule as far as standing armies go. And, but that all changed, Dean Sprague wrote, when the, the government could snatch men everywhere, shut down newspapers in Ohio, Minnesota, New York, all over the place. So this wasn't just Maryland in the, in the D.C. area. This happened all throughout the north, all the border states, uh, Missouri as well as Maryland and Kentucky, that uh, firearms were confiscated by the Army and, uh, and people were sent to prison from all over. So this, this wasn't local, a localized thing. The, the, the uh, Lincoln cult... Uh, the number they put on the number of people in prison was 13,000, but there is a Columbia University Law Journal article that said, says that it's probably closer to uh, 30,000. Uh, 
and I think it's probably even more than that as far as uh, individuals from the north thrown in jail. And James Randall you know, says about 300 newspapers were shut down. That's a lot of newspapers, you know, considering how small the country was then uh, compared to today. Population of 30 million in total. So it's one tenth the size of, t of the population today of the United States. Well, I know uh, during Reconstruction, the Republican Party actually subsidized with tax dollars pro-Republican newspapers, and uh, and uh, I don't know that they uh, that they intimidated uh, the opposition newspapers like they did during the war. Uh, Lincoln was gone, and so it takes a real dictator and a tyrant and a brute to to go through with this. And I don't think Andrew jo Johnson or Ulysses Grant. Uh, were were like that as much as uh, as much as Lincoln was, and so uh, so I'm I'm not aware that there was a big crackdown on the, on the newspapers, but I do know that they did subsidize with tax dollars the pro-Republican papers, especially in the South uh, after after the war. But, uh, the press in the South. Um, yeah, there was there was some uh, there was some some of that, uh, but uh, I don't think there was much of a need for uh, need for it. Uh, um, you know, the Richmond uh, newspaper was probably the the biggest paper in the southern states, and it was and it was uh, just reporting on the war, and it was supportive, of course, of the of the whole effort. So there would never have been any need uh, for the government to censor them if Jefferson Davis wanted to censor censor that. But uh, I'm not aware of any literature that talks about a widespread censorship uh, in, in the southern states. There, in fact, uh, there there were a lot of debates that went. They did go on. Uh, a lot of the states' uh, governors and state governments disagreed with Jefferson Davis's uh, war policies and uh, would sometimes uh, refuse or delay sending more troops when he would ask for for uh, to run, to send more militia troops. And so this was widely known that there was disagreement. There's a man named George Rabel who wrote a book, uh, called, I think it's called uh, The Confederate Republic, I think, Confederate, something like that. And it was about the uh, dissent and differences of opinion between the different groups uh, within the Confederacy. And uh, so that, that was expressed. They did have arguments. And it wasn't crushed like it was in the, in the Lincoln administration uh, so, so much. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, you mentioned that in one of your debates that one of these Lincoln idolaters um, denied that Lincoln ever did anything unconstitutional. Yeah, Harry Jaffa said that, yes. Um, how would uh, one of these idolaters then deal with um, the suspension of habeas corpus? What would their response to that be? <clears throat> well, you'd, you'd have to ask them what their response would be. But um, I know Jaffa himself is an expert in rhetoric. He's not a political scientist by training. He's not a historian by training. He's not a Civil War historian. He's not an economist. He's rhetoric. Uh, and he's written two books 50 years apart on uh, Lincoln's speeches, basically. And so you can read this whole book, his latest book. You can read the whole book, and there's no mention anywhere of anyone dying in the book. It's about Lincoln and the Civil War and so forth. But there's, no, there's no blood. There's no war. Uh, there's very little real history in it. It's all rhetoric and interpretations of rhetoric, uh, clever interpretations of rhetoric. And so it's sort of like, uh, you know, the, the sort of the, the Bill Clinton style of, of, of uh, historical research by focusing on speeches and what people say as opposed to what they do. And if you do that, if you look at Lincoln's speeches on the Constitution, well, you could probably make a very strong argument that he was, he was a big supporter of the Constitution because he said he was. Just, here's his speeches. And I think that's what Jaffa would do. That's what he does. He focuses on not all of Lincoln's speeches, but the prettier sounding ones, especially the ones that invoke God, even though uh, Lincoln was not a believer in God, as far as anybody knows. But uh, he, he, was a, he did know the Bible. He read the Bible. He read Shakespeare. His library consisted of the King James Bible, the works of Shakespeare, and all the rest were books on uh, rhetoric and speech making in his, his personal library. Uh, there's no evidence that he ever read the Federalist Papers, as far as I'm concerned. There's nothing, hardly anything at all, nothing at all in political philosophy, history, his rhetoric and speech making, the law. He was, he was a lawyer. He was a, a trial lawyer. Uh, 
and uh, and Shakespeare in the Bible, and uh, that, that was a great way to. He was a, a, a genius at using, you know, the the, the uh, stories from Shakespeare and the Bible to to persuade audiences of, of his points. But I think that's what Jaffa would do. He would look to, the, to his speeches, and I've heard some of his 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 he has he has these followers that that repeat like he he puts out the mantra. Lincoln never did anything constitutional, and they'll give a re, uh, explanation based on Lincoln's speeches, and then his followers will all repeat this over and over and over and over again. They, they seem to hope that repetition will make it true. Uh, that's why when I debated him, I mentioned facts, and this is what happened, and he got very angry. And that's why he, he keeps going. You know, Lincoln never did anything that was unconstitutional, but, but I, I can't see how you can do that. I, it's, in fact, uh, there is an audio of that, and I don't know if it picked it up, but there was a lot of laughter in the audience when he said that because I had just recited all these facts. And, uh, and, uh, and even during, his, during my debate with him, I, I cited that same thing from King George where he listed the individual states that he was signing the peace treaty with. And he denied that that was true. And I, had, I actually had a, a photocopy of the actual the treaty with Great Britain in my hand and, and read from it. And, uh, and, and he denied that that was true. And, but, but, and, uh, and I was mystified at that point. Now, how, could he do, how could he deny this? But I, I, I think I did figure it out, though, that it's all based on rhetoric. If you, uh, if you read Lincoln's speeches, he'll deny that any such thing as state sovereignty ever existed. He did in his first inaugural address. And if you rely only on that, then you have a whole different view of the world. You have an alternative reality, and that's what the so-called Straussians have. They have an alternative reality of American history that is often sharply in conflict with actual history. So what they usually do is they wage personal smear campaigns against anyone who disagrees with the cult leader. Um, the most recent one was I got an email from Professor Kleis Rinn of Catholic University who wrote an article uh, that was on lourockwell.com critical of the Straussians and uh, Jaffa in, in particular. And they've had a whole debate on the Claremont Institute's uh, website over this. And uh, well, Professor Rinn sent the whole thing to me online and he said he was sort of taken aback at how so many of the comments were personal, just personal attacks. It was not just Jaffa, but he has this stable of followers that do the exact same thing. That's uh, uh, Jaffa himself accused uh, Professor Rin of being of. He's, he said he's not just criticizing me and my fellow Straussians, but he's criticizing Jesus Christ himself. And, and Jaffa's logic was. Professor Rin was criticizing people who claim that it's just for the American military to wage war in foreign lands on the basis of some abstract principle that has nothing to do with justice or national defense, like democracy in the Middle East, for example. And, and that's what Jaffa is known for, the spouting off these abstract principles to justify interventionism. And Jaffa's, one of Jaffa's responses in this recent exchange between him and Professor Rin, the R-Y-N is how it's spelled, was that, well, uh, Jesus Christ uh, believed in absolute principles, uh, you know, do unto uh, the Bible, do unto others as you would want others to do unto you. So I suppose Professor Rin is calling him a Jacobin, just like he's calling me a Jacobin. So it's sort of semantic BS is what they specialize in. It has nothing to do with history or reality, but that, that's the sort of thing you get you know, from the... Fortunately, very few people in the academic world pay attention to these characters. That's why n almost none of them has a real academic job. There are very few of them. That's why they're all at think tanks in the AEI and the Claremont Institute. And, uh, there are politics. Uh, you know, you know, the academic, real academics you know, don't tolerate that sort of thing, and they shouldn't. Uh, I've heard various absurd examples for why, uh, or reasons why uh, Lincoln should maintain the union. I think. The most absurd I've heard is that if Lincoln didn't maintain the Union, uh, the Union could have never fought Hitler during World War II. <laughs> so we had to thank we had to thank Lincoln for defeating Hitler. Well, well, who did defeat Hitler during World War II? It was it was a coalition, wasn't it? Right. You know, why wouldn't the Southern states have formed the co uh, joined the coalition if, with the Northern states uh, for for one thing? And I also think you could uh, you know if you look at history, a book another book I'll, I'll recommend to you is uh, Wilson's War by Jim Powell. He was a friend of the Austrian school. He was, a, he was a student of Friedrich Hayek at the University of Chicago, among others. Hayek wasn't his dissertation advisor, but he, was, he took, he, Hayek was there when uh, Jim Powell was a student. He was a, cl uh, a classmate of Ralph Rako's. 
Jim Powell. And, uh, and uh, he, he argues that Woodrow Wilson was probably the worst American president ever because he plunged us into World War I when it wasn't any of our business. And he, he explains why, his theory of why he thinks that, that event, the American entry into World War I, ended up strengthening the hand of the Bolsheviks in Russia and led to Hitler in Germany. Uh, because of the Versailles Treaty was so oppressive to the Germans that the, the German people fell for a dictator who promised uh, you know, great things for, for Germany after that. And so he makes a book-length case of this. And But I would add to that, I would make the case that if, if, if the South had seceded peacefully, it would have been the one counterexample in the entire world in the early 20th century of a, a government that was not a highly centralized, consolidated, monopolistic state. Because after this, we had the Russian government and the German government. Uh, the, the trend was massive consolidation of the of, uh, governments that forming empires that became imperialistic. And had the South peacefully seceded, this would have been a counterexample to all of that uh, of government. And I think uh, it would have not only been a counterexample to the world, but it would have greatly weakened the, uh, the U.S. government. The U.S. government, uh, if, if nothing else, it wouldn't have been able to attack, tax a big chunk of the population, the southern states. And it would also have known that if it would engage in unconstitutional actions like the Spanish-American War that had nothing to do with the, the defense of the United States, that uh, there might be another threat of secession. Uh, you know, the War of 1812, New England essentially seceded from that by not participating, by refusing to send troops uh, in any significant degree. If, uh, if uh, they even went so far as to put men in debtor's prison, if there were recruiting officers coming around that, trying to recruit militia for the War of 1812, and then when they would leave, the guy would get out of debtor's prison, you know, uh, things like that. And so I think that sort of thing might have happened, that uh, there would have been a, a bigger break on these unconstitutional usurpations of power that the United States government had. And if that had happened, there may ne never have been an American entry into World War I. And if, if not, there may not have been a World War II. You know, if you want to speculate about the Nazis and things like this, I can speculate too. But I think my story is much more plausible than we wouldn't have been able to defeat the Nazis without this. So I've had all, I give a talk at uh, Grove City College and some of the, uh, the history and political science people there came up to me afterwards, and, and I, I gave it on Lincoln's birthday uh, last year, February 12th, and, uh, and said, well, you know, if, if not, you know, isn't it a good thing that Sherman, Sherman's march where he bombed cities and, and burned cities to the ground and, and did all this, that it sort of established a precedent for the bombing of Dresden and the, and the dropping of the atomic bomb on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Isn't that a good thing? And I said, no, mass murder of civilians is mass murder of civilians, no matter who does it. And so, but that's the way some people think. It's thank goodness Sherman mass murdered civilians uh, because it established a precedent for future U.S. governments to mass murder civilians. And isn't that a good thing? And, uh, and this is at a religious school. These are, these, uh, this Grove City is supposedly a religious school. There's still mandatory chapel there. And, uh, but that's how a lot of modern, uh, uh, evangelical Christians think, apparently, that uh, you know, bombs away. Is it somewhere in the Bible they apparently believe? I don't know. That's a, yes, sir, he had his hand up. Do, do you have an opinion of why Lincoln and Gettysburg Address and the Fourth Corps, blah, 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 was referring to the Declaration of Independence where it's less defensible, I think, than, you know, oh, yeah. sort of perpetual enemy. Why wouldn't he have chosen something more defensible? Uh, yeah, well, he, he made a big deal. Of, that's why uh, this guy, Je yeah, yeah, that's why you know nothing, uh, nothing. Uh, we mentioned Harry Jeff. I don't think anything he has ever written in his 60-year career. He's been around a long time. Is any different than uh, um, Lincoln's own propaganda? It might use different language slightly, but it's just book after book, of written article after article. It's essentially the same uh, rendition of the same propaganda, but. But he, he, he certainly chose 1776 uh, to make his point that the country was founded there because uh, I think because he knew that the Constitution, which occurred much later, uh, there were state ratification uh, uh, elections. 
And so the states were sovereign. They chose to, to join the Constitution or not. Uh, and that would, that would have been too obvious that he was in the wrong and the South was in the right if he mentioned the Constitution. So he chose the Declaration, and he chose not all the, not all the Declaration, though. He chose that the all men are created equal uh, slogan in the de Declaration, but ignored the rest of it, which is a classic states' rights doctrine. It, it refers to the states as, a, as a free and independent, sovereign states uh, all throughout. Uh, read the last paragraph, the very last paragraph of the Declaration of Independence. It doesn't say anything about the whole people in there, but that was his, that was his uh, tactic and rhetoric, I think, is to focus on that one line, that all men are created equal. And, uh, and that's what Jaffa has done his whole life, although clearly Lincoln did not believe in equality, uh, equality of rights. He, uh, he, he, for black people, he was, he, was, he was against it every step along the way. He was opposed to making them, uh, giving them the right to vote, to, to allowing them to be jurors. Uh, he, was, he, was, uh, he supported the Illinois Black Codes. He was a manager of the Illinois Colonization Society, which succeeded in getting the legislature to allocate money to deport the free black people out of the state. He, uh, and as president, he wanted to, uh, he actually uh, got millions of dollars allocated to, uh, to uh, increase the colony in Liberia of American blacks, and, and he sent 500 of them there. Uh, Joe Sober in the columnist once remarked that uh, uh, if Lincoln believed in equality, he only believed that black people could be equal somewhere else, not here, and somewhere else other in the United States. And so, and, but that's, that's been the whole, the whole shtick of the Claremont Institute and uh, Harry Jaffa, that Lincoln supposedly was a champion of uh, equal rights, uh, equal natural rights for all people. But that's based just on his one, the, the Gettysburg Address statement. It's not based on Lincoln's lifelong behavior and his many other statements of, all, of other kinds everywhere. They ignore all these other statements where he, he even used the word uh, uh, superior to, to describe what he thought should be the proper relation between the white and black races. You know, the, the white race should have a superior position is his exact words. And so, you know, that's not equality. Uh, but again, you know, um, the slick use of rhetoric and the careful selective choosing of out of context quotes can help you make the case that he was an advocate of natural rights for, for everybody. And then that's basically what they do. I think that's why he chose 1776 in the Gettysburg Address. A good, a good uh, critique of the Gettysburg Address is uh, one by H.L. Mencken, which you can find online. And uh, another one is Charles Adams. In his book, When in the Course of Human Events, he has a whole chapter uh, dissecting the, the Gettysburg Address almost line by line in, uh, and raising big questions of, over what it all uh, is saying. Mencken's main point was... Uh, uh, it was all backwards. It was the South that was fighting uh, for the right of consent. They no longer consented to being governed by Washington, D.C., and it was the North that was fighting to deprive them of that consent. But the Gettysburg Address says the opposite. It's, it's Orwellian language, in my view. Yes, sir. No, I said that was that was one reason. It wasn't the only reason. The, the the extension of slavery into the territories was another issue, but it was related to the economic issues like the tariff and the bank, because. Uh, well, so, I, I had a look at the South Carolina Declaration of Secession. Yeah. And it's it's all about slavery. Yeah. No mention at all about the tariff. Yeah. Right. Well, that's one that's one statement in the, the, the war though. The, the war is is different. I mean, the, what is the, the question is what is the reason for the war? Right. So not the not. The south because, uh, no one says no one. Not even historians today say the war. The North attacked the South to free the slaves. They they they, they were they were the the purpose uh, the reason Lincoln gave the reason the U.S. Congress gave, and uh, and anyone else in the North was to save the Union, or or to destroy the secession movement. And, but the thing is, the thing, the two are related. Without, without uh, the Union, you know, with the South out of the Union, there was no hope of, of having a continental empire. Uh, the South was declaring itself essentially a free trade zone with minimal tariffs, whereas the North had 50% tariffs. 
And so even before the war broke out, there were northern newspapers calling for the bombardment of the southern ports because they thought much of the commerce of the world would flow to New Orleans and Charleston, South Carolina, and away from Boston and New York. And so these, these plans that the Republican Party had for a high tariffs to finance in, uh, railroads and all that would have been crushed by the secession of the South. So that's why I say that the two things, the saving the Union or keeping the South in the Union and these economic issues are not separate. That was, that was the reason for keeping, in their eyes, for keeping the South in the Union and, and going to war over it. Uh, the Deep South mentioned slavery and uh, I think what they were most afraid of was its slave insurrections that might have been encouraged by the, uh, by the, uh, by the North. I don't think slavery was a secure institution in, at that time. They, they weren't seriously concerned about uh, the demise of slavery at that time. And the, the whole debate was only about the extension of slavery. And I think what they were saying is that we'll do with slavery what the, uh, what the people in New England did and get rid of it on our own terms but they didn't want uh, what they did about it to be dictated to them. They didn't dictate to, to the New Englanders how they should deal with their slavery. And slavery existed in, in New England for over 200 years, beginning in the, in the 17th century. Uh, and so uh, that's another one of the myths, the myths of the morally superior North uh, that existed. But slavery existed beginning, I think, in the, in the early 1600s in New England the, the transatlantic slave trade was centered in Newport, Rhode Island, in Boston, Massachusetts. Even after the Civil War, they were still building slave ships that were used to gather slaves from Africa and, and ship them to the uh, Caribbean, uh, and because their slavery didn't end in places like Brazil until 1887. And, uh, and how they ended slavery in the North was uh, they began in 1794 with phased in emancipated proclamation. They would pass laws saying that uh, any babies born of, of slaves will be free uh, upon reaching age 21 or 25. And so what that did was they phased out slavery uh, and it took them until 1865 to fi finally uh, get rid of slavery in New Jersey. And so, uh, so it's kind of a complicated issue of that. They, they issue these statements about slavery and. Uh, you could also look at Jefferson Davis's first inaugural address. He didn't mention slavery. He mentioned the economic issues, but not slavery in his first inaugural address, like Lincoln did. Lincoln's first inaugural address doesn't mention slavery as a reason for the war. Just the opposite. He denies that it has anything to do with uh, his intentions uh, at all. But he did mention, uh, did promise an invasion in his first inaugural address over tax collection, like I said yesterday. Uh, the, the Upper South, seceded, uh, uh, which was uh, Virginia, North Carolina, Arkansas, and Tennessee. They originally voted to stay in the Union, <clears throat> but then after Lincoln began invading their sister states, they took a revote and revoted and changed their minds and seceded. And so it's hard to make the case that slavery had uh, a lot to do with that because they originally, the, Lincoln's position was if you, you can keep your slaves if you're in the Union, but if you secede, we're going to do whatever we can to disrupt this and, and uh, take your slaves away from you because the slaves will help you in your war effort, in, your, in, in the war effort against us. And so his policy was always you can keep your slaves as long as you stay in the Union and continue to pay taxes to us. Uh, and in fact, all throughout the war, uh, like I said yesterday, there were southern non-slave owning soldiers who fought against northern slave owning soldiers in, in every major battle of the war because the uh, northern states and the border states that were allowed to keep their slaves as part of the Union had soldiers in all the major armies uh, in all the major battles. So that's sort of an, 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 an irony there. But those, those secession documents uh, aren't proof of the cause of the war by any means. Uh, that's, nobody says that's what, what the cause of the war was. Any other questions or brilliant commentary out there? Like I said yesterday, I, this historian I debated uh, on, in North and South Magazine, I did get him to admit that no respectable historian today will say that uh, the North invaded the South to free the slaves. In fact, that, that's, that's kind of preposterous to believe that. I doubt that a single person who voted for Lincoln in 1860 thought that if I vote for him, he'll raise an army and, and uh, go down and 
kill 300,000 people and free the slaves. That's, that just wasn't on the radar screen at all. <laughs> no, they've, they've been getting worse and worse every year. <laughs> oh, so, so well, my, well, my book has only been out a few years, and this, my book's not the only book like this. Um, but I've had, uh, you know, my book, uh, I've heard through the grapevine or through various professors, it's been used in a lot of colleges and universities. A lot of high school uh, honors students or advanced placement students are using it. Homeschoolers buy a lot of my book uh, at, at the high school level. And uh, and so uh, it was used at Auburn as a foil last year, right, of how not to study history, which I think is a compliment to me because I, uh, and when Lincoln is concerned, uh, you know, how to study history as a Lincoln scholar is to take all these devious deeds he did, and, and if you can dream up five or six excuses for them, then you're a respected Lincoln scholar. And so it's sort of a compliment to me that they use my book as a foil as how not to do it because, you know, thank God, I don't want to be... Uh, an example of how to how to be a Lincoln scholar, and so uh, but I don't. The textbooks usually take 20 years to incorporate new knowledge anyway of any kind, and uh, and so uh, but who knows? I've I've been uh, I have another book coming out in October, and I know there are other people that are writing books uh, like this. I just I just uh, Professor Clyde Wilson just has an edited book of readings that I just uh, had him send to my publisher. Uh, for their consideration, so uh, you know, who knows? In the, in the, in a few years, things might change a little bit, but uh, it's pretty much uh, uh, extraordinarily politically correct right now. It's uh, probably the most extreme case of political correctness there is. Is this whole area of Lincoln and the Civil War and states' rights and all that? That's uh, just dissenting views are rarely tolerated. But uh, you'll get some. Yes, sir. One more. The uh, Confederate. No, that well, the, well, no, both the U.S. Constitution and the Confederate Constitution uh, forbade uh, uh, the transatlantic slave trade. The U.S. Constitution, it was 1808 when the, the slave trade was ended, and the Confederate Constitution did the same thing. Now, there, there are a number of ways you can interpret that. Uh, one way to interpret it is, you know, there were existing slave owners who had big plantations and owned many slaves. And uh, it would benefit them economically to have a ban on the importation of slaves because it would prop up the price of their slaves. And it would be sort of protectionism. It was a, you know, a protectionist argument. So uh, you could make a moral argument for that. And you could also make a purely economic protectionist argument for the ban on the importation of slaves. But, uh, and there probably were people who believe they're on both sides. But uh, being an economist, that's, I, I would tend to think it's most, it was mostly the economic argument is why they put that in there, because it, it, it enhanced the value of the slaves of the existing uh, slave owners. By, uh, just like if it was uh, banning the importation of uh, automobiles, it would let you sell your automobiles for a higher price here in the United, United States. It's sort of a similar kind of, kind of thing. There, there was an article about this uh, on um, the Mises.org a couple of weeks ago. Uh, on this on this very topic, so uh, by um, I forget who it was. Do you remember Mark? Who? Van Cott. Oh yeah, Norman Van Cott. Yeah, if you did a search of Norman Van Cott, two words V A N C O T T, dig up that article. And uh, I think it had to do with the uh, the U S Constitution's uh, prohibition of the transatlantic slave trade, but it's the same principle, same uh, economic principle. No, I'll have to recheck that. It's been. Uh, I don't think it's been yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it lasted a while. It lasted a while. Well, they did uh, end it for the most part. Although, you know, the transatlantic slave trade it was run out of New England. It was. It wasn't run out of the South. It was uh, Boston and, and Rhode Island is where it was the epicenter. In fact, they even used slaves to build the slave ships in Rhode Island in Massachusetts, uh, um, you know, well, in the uh, early in the 1800s, uh, 1700s. And so uh, that, that's where the slave trade existed. And so they, the fact that there were might have been laws against it didn't mean they didn't do it. 
they still, they still, we're still engaged in it, even if they transported slaves not here to somewhere else. The, the, the shipping part of it was centered in New England. That's, is, is it about time to time to quit? Okay. <laughs> habeas corpus, and um, there were uh, William Seward, the uh, Secretary of State, was put in charge of a secret police force, and there were thousands of these people were spies. It was sort of like in Eastern Europe uh, during the, on the, under the Soviet bloc where people would, uh, would spy on, uh, on their fellow citizens and if they were overheard saying something that was uh, uh, construed as being not uh, friendly toward the Lincoln administration, uh, then they could be hauled off in jail. And as I told you yesterday in uh, one of Lincoln's speeches, he actually said that if a conversation is being held about his policies, the war, and so forth, and a man remained silent and didn't say anything, he considered that to be treasonous. And so, uh, and so the word treasonous had a very broad definition during this time, and it, it essentially meant disagreement with Abraham Lincoln. Uh, it wasn't disagreement with the Constitution, per se, but him and his policies is, that is how they, they pretty much define treason, you know, remaining silent. Um, Dean Sprague says this about this whole process. The laws were silent, indictments were not found, testimony was not taken, judges did not sit, juries were not impaneled, convictions were not obtained, and sentences were not pronounced. The Anglo-Saxon concept of due process, perhaps the greatest political triumph of the ages, and the best guardian of freedom, was abandoned. End quote. And as I said, there were thousands of political prisoners in various places like Fort Lafayette and New York Harbor, and Sprague said that uh, uh, it's sort of strange that the only place in the northern states where there was genuine free speech was in Fort Lafayette. Because once you're in prison for, for speaking freely, what have you got to lose? What are they going to do, put you back in prison? You're, you're already there. And so, uh, so uh, men could speak, and women could speak freely if they were in one of the, uh, these gulags um, that were the, the Lincoln administration is uh, Frank Clement, K-L-E-M-E-N-T. And uh, uh, he wrote a book called Lincoln's Critics, and it contains um, a couple of chapters on civil liberties issues uh, during the war. So that's, as far as you know, constitutional issues, that's another good source. He, he has a good uh, discussion of that. So the question is, why is it that all these um, generations of scholars, and these are all pro-Lincoln scholars, by the way. In, uh, um, my favorite book in, in, of all of these is uh, Freedom Under Lincoln because of the information that's in it by Dean Sprague. But still, the last chapter is called Lincoln the Humanitarian. So he, go, he writes a whole book about the trashing of the Constitution. And then the last chapter is, is why it was a good thing that, that he did this. He's a great humanitarian. Uh, why do they do this? Why have they said these things? Um, well. Among the things uh, that, that he did was to launch a military invasion without the consent of Congress, first of all. Uh, you know, it wasn't, George W. Bush was not the first person, first president uh, to do that. Um, he blockaded southern ports without first declaring war, and he unilaterally suspended the writ of habeas corpus for the, uh, that uh, the Congress eventually came around and, and um, played its role in suspending habeas corpus. Now, of course, what habeas corpus is is what gives American citizens due process. If you're accused of a crime, you have a right to confront your accuser. You have a right to a, to a, a, a speedy trial and, and so forth. Uh, but when that is lifted, you know, Lincoln just announced that this was uh, no longer to be. Then the military could arrest anybody without even telling that person why, and then it could drag them off and they did not feel obligated even to tell their family or, or anybody where they were. So there were some people who were dragged off and thrown into prison uh, by the Lincoln administration who their families had no idea what happened to them for months, months and months at a time and over a year in, in some cases. And so uh, that was the suspension of... <clears throat> okay, well, welcome back. I tried my best to scare everyone, everyone off yesterday, but it didn't work. I usually do that with my classes, but on the first day I punch a hole in the blackboard, and uh, so they think I'm crazy. But there's a blackboard here, so yeah. You know, uh, but uh, I have a short announcement to make. And she reminded me. So, today is six six oh six, and uh, so naturally we'll talk about Lincoln today. Uh, wow. And, uh, and so my my 
you know, yesterday the, the, the major emphasis of what I had to say was about um, economics, Lincoln and economics, the tariff issue and the mercantilism issue. Uh, yeah, that was topic for yesterday. Uh, today, uh, it's, it's more going to be on an emphasis on, on liberty, Lincoln and, and liberty, Lincoln and the Constitution and states' rights, but they are all ultimately linked to economics as well. After all, economic liberty is, is uh, you know, arguably the most important form of liberty. Without economic liberty, we can't really have any other kind of, of liberty. And so uh, it's not as though these are mutually exclusive topics. And that's, by the way, that's one of the things I always uh, admired and was fascinated by when I, as a student, when I was your age, ran across the Austrians like uh, Ludwig von Mises and Murray Rothbard, and that they understood this. They understood that uh, to, to understand economics it took more than just economic theory. You had to understand something about history, philosophy, uh, mathematics, statistics, as well as the body of economics. And, uh, and there are different schools of thought of economics. So uh, I would urge you to think of the, the, your, your educational experience, uh, those of you who are students, uh, I guess you're all students, uh, one way or another, uh, as, as more interdisciplinary and, 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 um, and look at the Austrian school that way too. And so uh, Lincoln and the Constitution, um, uh, <clears throat> they're textbooks that you use in high school or maybe even college, but the, uh, the scholarly works are out there like this. And when I uh, uh, debated one of the big shot Lincoln, uh, I call them idolaters, I don't call them scholars, idolaters, uh, Harry Jaffa, he, he sort of angrily uh, announced that Lincoln, Lincoln never did anything, anything that was unconstitutional, which is a flat contradiction of what generations of scholars uh, have said. And he didn't provide any explanation of why he thought that, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you why he was wrong, you know, with, uh, with some historical facts. Other authors have said similar things. James Randall, another book, if you're interested in this whole topic, is Constitutional Problems Under Lincoln by James Randall. Uh, James McPherson, the, uh, the well-known uh, historian at Princeton, uh, calls Randall the, the preeminent uh, Lincoln scholar of the last generation. He wrote in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s for the most part. He was the uh, academic mentor of David Donald, who was a, a well, another well-known uh, Lincoln biographer won the Pulitzer Prize for his book on Lincoln. But here's what uh, Randall says. He says, if Lincoln was a dictator, it must be admitted that he was a benevolent dictator. So it must, he, doesn't, he doesn't say why it must be admitted. Uh, you know, when I read that, I, I had a vision of James Randall pointing a gun at me saying, it must be admitted, it must be admitted. He was a, but I, there's no explanation why it must. Uh, be like that. He, he wishes he was a benevolent dictator. But I would think that if you asked somebody in, say, South Carolina in 1865 if Lincoln was a benevolent dictator, he would probably disagree with James Randall. Um, so in another book that uh, talks about the Lincoln dictatorship is Freedom Under Lincoln by Dean Sprague. And uh, also, I mentioned this yesterday, Emancipating Slaves and Slaving Free Men by Jeffrey Hummel. Uh, surveys some of this literature, and the the, the uh, preeminent scholar of the uh, the Copperheads, the the Northern opposition. There are a number of books I'll I'll, uh, I'll tell you about, and uh, one of them. Uh, but first, I want to ask you a question. Uh, I think Lou Rockwell just came in a little late, and he didn't see my uh, introduction. I don't think. Can you can you read that, Lou? Okay. Um, but um, you know, as far as books go, I'm going to be giving you names of some books on Lincoln and the Constitution. But I want to ask you, uh, since everyone here is a, uh, presumably a, a student and a student of the Constitution, I think, uh, what part of the Constitution allows for a dictatorship? Who can who can tell me that? I'll, I'll buy you a uh, a milkshake at Toomer's if you can tell me that. That's right. He got the right answer. There, there, is, there, is, there is no provision of the U.S. Constitution that allows for a, a dictatorship. Um, but, um, well, one book I'll mention is um, there's a man named Clinton Rossiter who taught, um, taught at um, Cornell for many, many years, decades, I think. Uh, he wrote a book called Constitutional Dictatorship, which sounds, uh, you know, in the American tradition, it sounds like an oxymoron. Um, like uh, jumbo shrimp or military intelligence uh, <laughs> uh, and so forth. But uh, in Constitutional Dictatorship, he devoted a chapter to uh, called the Lincoln Dictatorship. 
where he says this, uh, dictatorship played a decisive role in the North's successful effort to maintain the Union by force of arms. One man was the government of the United States. Lincoln was a great dictator and a true Democrat. And, uh, and so th those are two words you don't usually put together, dictator and Democrat, but that's, that's the sort of thing you run, in, run into in this literature. And he, he also went to say, Lincoln's amazing disregard for the Constitution was considered by nobody as being legal, end quote. And so, and so I've read all this literature. You can read, the, the history is out there. It doesn't make it into the 